if anything, hopefully, if nothing else, it's giving a voice to some of these individuals who are easy to, are easy to overlook. They're not necessarily flashy. They don't necessarily have what we perceive as you know, entertainment value, but you get to know them a little bit and, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot there. This is Entrepreneurs The Playbook, where I give you access each week to the world's greatest athletes and executives about their personal and professional playbook and what has made them champions on and off the field. This is The Playbook. This is Dave Meltzer, CEO of Sports One Marketing, here with Entrepreneur The Playbook, and I have a special guest, Andrew Jenks. Welcome to The Playbook. Thank you for having me, yeah. I love having people outside of the sports industry, but yet letting entrepreneurs know there's so many different ways if you're a sports fan which you are yeah absolutely to get involved made a few sports movies that's right yeah. to get involved with what you love and i think too many people have a very narrow vision of hey i want to be the general manager of the yankees mm -hmm. you know and the funny thing is if you have that narrow vision most people don't have the sacrifice that it takes to do it right they think mm -hmm. cashman just kind of walked into that job mm -hmm. you know i'm going to start there you're a hard-working guy mm -hmm. And I think you've taken pride in being a mule-like person that you can outwork people. <laughs> how, how do you equate? How'd your, you get that? How'd you know that? I'm, I'm a, an empathetic. Uh, I channel <laughs> things, but no, you, it's, I think it's important because there is a, a, a intuitive uh, contradiction between working hard, which, mm. I, which I see you doing, mm -hmm. but also allowing things to happen. Can you reconcile those two things? Oh man, that's a good question. That's, that's got to be the best first question I've ever heard in my life. Uh, yeah, I think if there's one consistency in the projects that I've worked on, it would definitely be not just time spent on the projects, but I'd like to think time well spent. So for my first movie, which is 90 minutes refilmed over 200 hours, second movie about 90 minutes, it was over 10,000 hours. TV show, which was 30 minutes with commercial breaks. It's only 24 minutes reshot over 100 hours per episode. So um, in those scenarios, it's really putting in the time. And then it's also kind of, I don't know how I describe it, but maybe like a very stubborn patience to let the story unravel. You know, there's, it's, a, it's a little bit cliche, but there's a saying that a buddy of mine uses, which is if you're project is the same at the end as you thought it would be in the beginning, it means you weren't listening in between. And I've always found that to be the case. Like, um, if, if you're not really paying attention and leaning into the stories and the characters you're finding, you're gonna end up missing a lot of the best stuff. You know, that's so important. Even in business, I tell people, you know, they ask, what's your best piece of advice? I said, stay in business. Because I don't know one business, you know, I see a lot of business plans. I got a TV show that's elevator pitch. I don't know one business, successful business today, that started out with the success they're in huh. today. So if you right. look at Google was a search optimization tool. Uh, Yahoo was an index. Uh, e even Amazon was a book selling. Right. right? Oh, so, God, we forgot so it's the that. same thing, huh. right? So you, you have to look for the miracles or the lessons that occur and I think as a microcosm, your art and your job mm -hmm. uh, is a great reflection of that. And that uh, stubborn patience I want to touch on, you started off, if I'm not incorrect, like you were filming grass or something. <laughs> is that true? Damn, you do your homework. You got to. I got to get interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. You're an interesting guy. Yeah. So. Um, so, you know, when I was a kid, uh, we, we traveled around a lot and... My dad was in the UN, and so we were in Nepal and Belgium, and my best friend kind of became, I don't know if this sounds pathetic, but <laughs> kind of became a big, bulky VHS camera. And I would go everywhere pretending I was a CNN correspondent. And so I, I was working on this book, and I was looking back at all old home video footage, and I saw an hour of just grass, and I was in the background pretending to be James Earl Jones, who had the CNN, like, this is CNN, or however he does, <laughs> yeah. you know? And I was, I guess I was so bored that I was filming the grass and telling the story of what was going on. So I was like, now the wind is picking up, so you can see the grass at a 45 degree angle, da 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 da. And so that was in like elementary, middle school. Then high school, I did a public access show uh, called Internal Injustice, which 
didn't have any meaning, but I liked the alliteration. I thought it sounded good. <laughs> and public access in New York is channel six. So it was between Fox 5 and ABC 7, Friday nights at 8 o'clock. And I remember the prettiest girl in school, uh, in high school, came up to me and said, oh my god, you know, what are you doing here? And I said, what do you mean? And she goes, you have that public access show, uh, you know. And, and she goes, why are you in our high school? And I said, Sarah, I've been going to school with you for five, five years. <laughs> <laughs> you, never, right, right, right. you never recognized it? Because I was, I was this height with this voice and about quite a bit heavier <laughs> in high school, so I wasn't exactly the uh, Mr. Popular. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I've been filming, filming for uh, a long time now. Yeah, and it was one of the other interesting things, that, a parallel between you and I, is that for whatever reason, I've always been able to attract opportunities and people. Mm -hmm. And I try, and in the success of my life, I've always attracted the right opportunities and the right people. And when I thought I had everything and I wasn't happy, I attracted the wrong people hmm. and the wrong opportunities. And, mm. and I try to take a, a spiritual control of that. Um, what, you know, and I, I know there's the think, say, and do, which you do extremely well. There is a belief in an energy. What belief or energy do you think that you carry? Because this is what I think business people, entrepreneurs really want to know is like, how are you allowing or attracting all these, I mean, the people that you're around, you know, you do the, the, the Zen of Bobby V, but ESPN came to you at a very young age, mm -hmm. right? CAA wanted to represent you. You, you know, obviously so many great characters around you right now. I think The Rock is a producer of your podcast, yep. right? I mean, these aren't accidents. They're not, mm -hmm. they're coincidences, meaning they're coinciding with your beliefs and your energy. Yeah. You know, what, what it, are those beliefs or the energy you carry that you think attracts the world's best? I, I have only easy questions for you. Andrew, yeah, wow. <laughs> Man, I thought I had therapy at three, but uh, <laughs> Welcome all right. Welcome to the playbook. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, when I was 19, I dropped out of NYU and moved into a nursing home. And my grandfather was, for the first time, uh, really showing signs of dementia. And I thought, at 19 years old, in a college dormitory, uh, I saw some parallels. Like, he was in a nursing home surrounded by 300 strangers, and I was in a dormitory surrounded by 300 strangers. We just happened to be at different points in, in life. And everybody was on drugs at both. And everybody was on drugs at both. <laughs> Shit, that's, that's good, yeah, I never, never thought of that. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I didn't and, go to NYU, but I just figured. No, no, yeah, it reeked it, yeah. Um, and so I thought it would be interesting to spend a summer living in a nursing home. And I wasn't able to get into his because of HIPAA violations, wasn't able to get into 20, 30 different nursing homes, finally found one in Florida that would let me go there, go there for free, film everything. And my biggest takeaway was there was one woman named Tammy who was 96 years old. She couldn't really see that well, hear that well, walk, she was in a wheelchair, but her mind was totally intact. And she would go around at lunch and dinner, dinner's at like, you know, four o'clock. That's when I um, eat. Yeah, oh really. <laughs> and uh, she would, you know, it could get pretty gloomy there. And she would go from table to table. She'd be wheeled around by Libby, who was her best friend, and she would tell sex jokes. And so even if it was for like a moment or a minute, people would start cracking up. And so she used her mind to help other people. There was another guy named Bill who was 81 years, 82 years old. He had been in the Marines, extremely strong, physically able to do a lot, uh, but was losing his mind. And what he, the one thing he did remember, of all things, he couldn't remember your name, couldn't remember so much. One thing he could remember was that across the street from the nursing home was a dollar store. And so every day at one o'clock, we would escape the facility and uh, walk to the dollar store and with five dollars, he'd buy, you know, four or five pieces of candy, come back and say, you know, Tammy, I know you like Skittles, Libby, I know you like this, John, I know you like this. And so, he mentally couldn't remember a lot, but whatever he did have, he would give to other people. And that was by far my biggest takeaway, uh, not just in the movie itself, but personally. And I, and I hadn't really thought of that for years until maybe a few years ago I'd been thinking about it. And I think that got to me in a way where I, I thought, huh, like if there's anything these people have learned in life, 
and really taken some sort of value in. It's, it's trying to do something for someone else. And uh, in a way, they're also doing it, you're also doing it for yourself. You're giving yourself some sort of value. So it's not a totally selfless, earnest thing, but it also is in a lot of ways. And I think um, that is who I look for in the people that I film and follow or people that I'm rooting for, uh, people that I've I come to, to really love, even if they're people that are very different than me. You know, I've, I film people who I disagree with on a lot of fundamental issues, but still am very much entranced with their intentions. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I am a big appreciation guy. And originally, when I went down the path of being living in a state of appreciation, I only thought about the gratitude side of things. Mm. And when I watch uh, your stuff and listen to your podcast, there is a tremendous amount of gratitude hmm. uh, that is involved in the energy of what that. you do. Yeah. But there's also the other side of appreciation that, that I see uh, when I watch your stuff. And it's adding value. So what I see is, you know, the lens picks up what you see, but it's interesting because you have hundreds of hours that are narrowed down. It comes through you and you're adding value to what you've seen. Hmm. And I think it's a great analogy to life that you've taken this perspective of adding value and that's the takeaway that you got from you know living in a in an old age home and seeing how other people are adding value despite their disabilities yeah. and your podcast talks about you know taking people that have shortages voids and obstacles and focusing in on the blessings that they do have mm. what what lesson or have you learned the most from the podcast because you have such extraordinary people on there mm. that have disadvantages mm -hmm. but yet they have tremendous blessings and power yeah give, give me one example of something that touched you because there's so many that's touched me you know um You know, it, it, I don't know if this totally answers your question, but circling back to what we were saying earlier about mm -hmm. you never know where your story's gonna go. Yeah. There's all these rumors about why Michael Jordan retired in 1993. And there was a lot of speculation that it had to do with his gam, uh, there was a lot of rumors about yeah. why he retired in 93. And there was a lot of speculation that it had to do something with his father's death. His dad had been murdered about two or three months before he retired. And they thought, and by they I mean the media, public at large, and you can go on YouTube and see these conspiracy theories that Jordan was in debt for all of his gambling, a lot of debt, and someone killed his father uh, as retribution. And so I looked into this, and I'd like to think pretty systematically explained in detail why that wasn't the case. While I was doing it, I was looking at the trial of the two men who were convicted of killing James Jordan, Michael's dad, and I had done a wrongful conviction documentary and series before, and I was looking at the trial in passing, and I thought, something seems off about this trial. One of these two guys seems innocent. His name is Daniel Green. He, was, he did help dispose of the body, after, afterwards, but after reading the trial transcripts, the interrogation transcripts, uh, the uh, blood reports, the autopsy, you know, hundreds of pages, if not more, of documents, and talking to different lawyers and other people I know in the wrongful conviction world, came to the conclusion that without a doubt, he was innocent. And so I called up his lawyer and said, what's going on? This is, this is really strange. He, Daniel's clearly innocent. The other guy definitely seems to have done it. Um, Daniel's been in prison now for 25 years, and it doesn't seem like he's done an interview in eight years. How, why hasn't he done any interviews? And she said, well, everyone's too afraid to talk to him. And one line of thinking was that it would piss off Jordan. And I talk, then I talked to Daniel a couple times on the phone and luckily, I have a great team at the podcast that uh, let me go down, interview Daniel, uh, and we did a special episode on him. And I'm now working as much as I can 
for him to be released. Uh, he's been in jail for 25 years for a murder he didn't commit. And so I think that it's kind of like if, you, if, you're, if you're sometimes not even looking, but just aware of what's right in front of your nose, uh, you can find some pretty cool stuff. Or, and not cool in this case, but interesting. And he's now, since our interview, been interviewed by the Chicago Tribune, um, by a list of other, other places. And I think uh, he has a great lawyer. The momentum is building where, where he has a court case coming up uh, where maybe some movement is made. You know what's extraordinary about that? And you watch the movie The Hurricane, mm. right? Very similar circumstance. Yeah. Um, and I'm a universe person. And, you know, certain people uh, are seekers. And people that are in your industry, you seek the truth, right? You're pursuing a certain truth to help inspire other people, to help educate, enlighten. And it just while you're telling that story, all I can think about is there's no, there are no accidents, right? Like. Here, you're trying to do something else, but yet an inspiration comes to you as you're gathering this data, you're, you're looking at it, and, and you see something that's not right. Now, the universe picks you because you're a person that is someone that does something about mm. it. Mm. When you look at, you know, luck, you know, coming from that hard work aspect, you're an extremely patient person, you know, and the construct of time for you is a man-made construct, I can tell. You can't sit and do hundreds of hours of filming to get down to 17 minutes or whatever without understanding time's a man-made construct. When you're touched by the truth, and it, whether it's your podcast, your show, all the things you do, what, what do you think the distinction is that makes you actually act upon the truth? It's, so many people don't. You know, I just got done with a speech and the lady said, there, there's a political thing that I was mentioning saying, you know, I don't care what your political beliefs are. You have to believe that we're one. Right, we're all on the same team, mm. right? And, and I think with all the stuff that's been going on in our country, that we're losing the message that, hey, this isn't make America great again, this is make America better, mm. but there's people going halfway around the world in a caravan just to come in to, to enter the lowest ranks of our country, and yet so many people are losing our message right now that, hey, we're on the same team. Mm -hmm. You know, wh what is it that inspires you to, like, because most guys, and especially in your industry, are like, ah, you know, I think he's innocent, and mm -hmm. then move on. Mm -hmm. You you basically are like the hurricane, right? These people oh, from Canada, you know, this kid gets inspired because he reads the book. You know, I want to delve into this, you know, as our second to last question, what do you think the difference is in you that like does something about it? Another easy question. That's very, me. I mean, it's, <laughs> that was, uh, that's very. Uh... Andrew's never coming back on the playbook. <laughs> it's like, where'd you get this guy? Yeah, no, I, <laughs> Sorry. I, mean, I saved uh, you money today on therapy. You'll be fine. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that's, that's very nice of you. I, I, I don't know, man. Like, you, you hear, you talk to someone, like, I, I talk to Daniel, in, you know, who's in prison pretty frequently, and I don't really know how you could talk to him and not feel like you have an obligation to do something. I, I had been approached to make another documentary about a guy who had been wrongfully incarcerated for about 10 years um, for, a, for a murder that was, that not only did he, he didn't commit, but was based on someone else having a dream that he committed it. And once you talk to some of these individuals, I, I just don't know how you could turn your back. You know, I, I also, I mean, maybe I, I was also lucky in that my parents um, never made a lot of money per se, but I, I always will remember when we sat at the dinner table and my dad, like I had said, my dad worked at the UN. And so my mom would be like, sweetie, what'd you do today? And my dad would say, oh, we're trying to get the money to help save a million kids that are starving in Africa. And he'd go, what'd you do? And my mom <laughs> is a nurse practitioner in the hood, and she would be like, well, you know, there's a bunch of patients who can't get the medication to save themselves from HIV, and, uh, but it's available, so I'm trying to get it to them, you know, some roundabout way. Uh, but." they'll still you know, likely die, but I'm gonna see what I can do. And I'd be sitting there like, 
eating my chicken, you know, being like, holy yeah. shit, what is going on with the world? <laughs> and I think there's a part of that that kind of got in my head, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of things wrong. And I was hearing it every night about the world. And but all I saw were, were these two people who, in a very selfless way, you know, they weren't going around and doing interviews or on TV, you know, in really the most selfless, selfless way you can think, uh, were acting on it. And I think that is probably something that stuck with me from a really early age. That's awesome. Last question. Most filmmakers, producers, directors, actors, you know, all want to leave a legacy, right? There's a story. What legacy would you like to leave when it's all said and done? Shit, man. I don't know. I'm 32. I don't. <laughs> I'm not dying any. Uh, legacy. You look younger. Does that help you? <laughs> what? Oh, really? Usually, I get. You're 32. You look a lot older. Oh no, I'm uh, not 29. <laughs> um, uh, legacy. You know, uh, for for the MTV show that I had, we did an episode about, we did a whole season about a young woman with cancer who uh, has since passed away. We did a, an episode about a young man with autism, another man whose brother had been killed and lived in, in, a, in a tough area in Oakland. And this was on MTV. Yeah. And I would tell people that, and they, they thought, you know, it's on PBS or something. And I remember our show was followed by, it was either Teen Mom or Jersey Shore. And it was hilarious because, you know, we'd be like, you know, something serious is going on, and then it would cut to a promo, and it'd be like, coming up on Jersey Shore, <laughs> wasted, you know? Right, right. And, uh, sorry for yelling. And, uh, yeah. and, um, and I thought, and I was always really appreciative that MTV for years gave me that opportunity to tell the stories of these people who otherwise normally would never be given a voice. And that's true with the people in the old age home, the people that are in prison, uh, a lot of the people that we talk about on the podcast. Um, and so if anything, hopefully, if nothing else, it's giving a voice to some of these individuals who are easy to, are easy to overlook. They're not necessarily flashy. They don't necessarily have what we perceive as you know entertainment value but you get to know them a little bit and and there's there's a there's a lot there yeah i think your gift can best be described as someone who can take a piece of grass <laughs> and show its beauty and inspiration <laughs> i like that yeah. right you, you literally from the very start of you know you and your best friend the, the big vhs machine on your shoulder yeah. you've been able to find blessings in the most basic of things and, and I, I think that's a great legacy because we all have blessings in us and it takes people like you sometimes to uh, amplify and perpetuate the blessings that we all have no not even determined on the circumstance and I, I just I'm humbled by you I appreciate oh, you really sweet of you. Uh, Thank you know you. anything I can do to, to help you your, your work is incredible I and appreciate I that. really look forward to the next 64 years, and then I'll come visit <laughs> we'll you see. and your yeah, home, there we go. and I'll video you. Yeah, so I'm yeah, gonna do yeah. 111, I like that man. Idea so a lot. I'll be right at the end. Yeah. My first Dave Melter doc. I like that, yeah, <laughs> never too late. Yeah, the, yeah. the end of the road, that's yeah. it, I got the name. Yeah. All right, Andrew, thank Dave, you so much for coming you. on yeah, The Playbook. Absolutely. This is Dave Melter with Entrepreneur, The Playbook. <laughs>